Welcome everybody to the um, session on European gas. Market transformation confronts new risks. Um, just take a minute to put it into perspective because uh, the 28 states of the European Union represent the second largest gas market in the world. But consumption last year crashed to its lowest level in nearly two decades, at just over 400 billion cubic meters. That puts it well behind the 750 BCM consumed by the biggest market, the US. Now, in Europe, you can buy spot gas for $6 per million BTUs. That's half what it was a few years ago, but it's still twice as much in the US. So you can imagine it's difficult for Europe to compete on that level. Why is gas suffering in Europe? One of the key reasons is uh, the underlying weakness of the European economy. The gas has also been backed out of power generation by coal and renewables. Uh, one tiny bright spot is the growing use of gas, or more specifically LNG as a transportation fuel for shipping and heavy road transport, but that's only a tiny glimmer representing roughly about 1% of the total. <clears throat> so what's the role of gas in Europe now? Uh, the gas industry is looking for guidance uh, from policymakers, above all that perhaps. Um, maybe the uh, climate talks in Paris in December will provide some answers. Let's see. Anyway, to look at the new risks um, facing the gas industry, we've got three experts here. We've got uh, Roberto Cazula from ENI, who's going to be giving a producer view on the issue. Uh, we've got Gertjen Lankhorst from Gas Terra, uh, who's going to be uh, looking perhaps at what's needed uh, to rejuvenate the sector, what sort of uh, uh, you know, guidance could be come from the policymakers. And we've got Mehmet Aguchu from Global Resources Partnership, who's going to be sort of examining the EU's uh, policy on uh, commitment to energy security. So, thank you. Roberto, yeah. the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you. Good afternoon uh, to everybody. Thanks for uh, inviting uh, Ian I and myself to, to this panel. Uh, as you said, I will give you the NI perspective, as uh, we are not only a Mediterranean and European uh, gas leader, but also a major worldwide gas uh, producer. And uh, I will uh, stick to this side of, uh, of the story as the commercial insight, possible commercial insights that could be possibly delivered by my distinguished co-panelists are much greater than what I have uh, to offer. So uh, before we look uh, uh, forward, uh, I think it's useful to look back at the context of uh, the European gas demand by focusing on two points. Firstly, the, the key word uh, over the past uh, seven years uh, or so has been contraction. Uh, means that uh, since 2008, the European gas demand has uh, fallen by about 20% down to 420 billion cubic meter in 2014. Secondly, today's energy mix is unsustainable. Coal power uh, generation accounts for almost 80% of uh, total power uh, emissions. And we know that uh, this imbalance is uh, mainly due to the difference in price between uh, uh, gas and coal. So why do I mention this? Well, you know that uh, in a couple of months uh, in, in Paris, uh, COP21 will uh, likely enforce uh, new objectives to ensure that uh, the uh, two degrees uh, uh, Celsius uh, temperature is uh, respected. And uh, this is uh, where the gas comes in. As we know, toward uh, a low carbon future, we think that uh, renewables will certainly play a, a major role, but gas must be the bridge to help us to satisfy both demand and uh, environmental policy. So let us now turn uh, to talk about uh, uh, Europe uh, gas supply over the last uh, 60 years and uh, how it looks uh, uh, today. Historically, um, domestic gas production has come from uh, the Netherlands, uh, Norway, UK. We've uh, 
major imports from uh, uh, Russia and uh, uh, North Africa. Well, these uh, main areas of supply created uh, segregated uh, market uh, regions uh, and uh, associated corridors such as uh, Eastern, continental, southern Europe. This means that uh, today the gas flows uh, uh, run uh, from east to west, from north to south, with uh, uh, major limitations in where the gas exactly is needed. Think about uh, the difficulty in moving gas uh, uh, from, uh, from Spain uh, to France or even from Italy to, uh, to, central, uh, to central Europe. So it is uh, the right time now to, to push for uh, a new uh, European regulatory framework uh, able to turn uh, this uh, uh, 28 uh, gas market into a single one uh, through the development of uh, interconnection and uh, reverse flow uh, mechanism. The idea of integration uh, has been debated at uh, uh, European level uh, for a while now, but uh, uh, we think that we need a strong commitment to push at uh, policy level toward a very reachable uh, goal. And uh, here the, the, the keystone is uh, diversification of uh, supply, but uh, how? Well, uh, we have to say that uh, intraconnection can uh, reinforce internal strength, but uh, what about a more solid south-north uh, corridor? Uh, at any, we think uh, that Africa must play an important role. Uh, better connectivity between uh, Europe and uh, Africa can uh, create synergies where uh, Europe's technologies and investment underpin African development. Africa can look at Europe as a stable market for its uh, resources, and Europe can, can receive uh, safe uh, supply flows. Uh, the Mediterranean could be the first uh, building block uh, because of uh, its potential in uh, North Africa, in uh, Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, I would also add uh, uh, the Central Asia, uh, thus uh, bringing new volume of gas uh, into the picture, uh, both via pipe and via LNG. So uh, commitment and uh, strong uh, cooperation uh, between the two continents uh, on this uh, specific corridor can certainly pave the way uh, to a sustainable and virtuous uh, uh, cycle with uh, a very positive effect on uh, a political, a geopolitical situation. This is what uh, at any we think is a, a viable and a sustainable way forward. That's uh, my great. message. Thank you. Thank you, Roberta. Great. Um, Gertjan, if I could just turn to you next. Um, uh, you, was, we, you know, we've got the, the Paris talks coming up, and you've got a good feeling for what the industry is looking for. If you can say something on that. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to comment on that, but also on yeah. a more general outlook on what European uh, gas demand might might do in the future. Um, I think I can echo a lot of what Roberto has already said. I agree uh, with all the remarks you made, but to put it all in, 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 a, in a slightly different perspective, I think um, European gas demand growth, the potential for that, um, supply diversification, and also shifting geopolitics, it all depends a lot the success of the gas market in Europe on how the political attitude in Brussels will be. Um, let me explain that. In the short run, um, the, the signs for um, the European gas demand are not hopeful. Um, the um, renewable energy is heavily subsidized, coal is very cheap, so gas is relatively too expensive. The carbon pricing system, the ETS, doesn't help at the moment. And moreover, there are uh, European and national policies aimed at reducing gas demand for heating. Um, it remains to be seen how successful this will be, but it doesn't favor gas demand. On the other hand, there's reason for optimism. If we take the two degrees uh, Celsius uh, maximum increase of, of temperature seriously, if Paris is a success, if a rapid reduction of CO2 emissions is deemed necessary, then the best option is gas. And that is um, a, a fuel that can play a, a vital role in the future of the European energy mix. Not only, not only, I stress that, by replacing 
coal in the power production, but also because, because gas offers significant opportunities for energy efficiency, for energy saving. It was mentioned in the last panel as well. When you use it in modern appliances, gas can really deliver quick wins. We know it, but it's not so clear to the public out there. I would like to see the European Commission not being ambivalent about the future role of gas. But the problem is the image of gas in Europe. Despite all of our gas advocacy efforts, all of our, I, I mean with our, I mean the gas industry in Europe, we have done tremendously much the past years to advocate for gas, but um, we, don't, we are not very successful. Reasons for that, fear by the people in Europe of dependency on Russia, the dirty image of shale gas, and in my own country, in the Netherlands also, the earthquakes that are a result of, of gas production and that have caused damage to 60,000 houses by now already. Therefore, it is for politicians at the moment very attractive to say or even to believe that we can do without gas within 20 to 35 years. We may be sure that it's not realistic, but it's a message that does it very well with the voters. It shows ambition in combating climate change, it reduces import dependency, and it creates green jobs in the renewable sector. That's the political message that is very popular at the moment. So our first challenge is how to argue against this line of thinking. Then, when it comes to supply diversification, I think that we can say that the liberalization of the gas market has been a great success in Northwest Europe. Um, it, 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 was, it started here in the UK, which is a success, but um, recently the TTF, the, 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 the hub in the Netherlands, has overtaken the MBP in size and in liquidity. And also the German and the Belgian hubs are growing. That's a success, but that's Northwest Europe. The South and the East are still problematic. And as we know, for supply diversification, you need a liquid market, a market that is seen by producers as a market that welcomes gas from all suppliers, pipeline gas or LNG. Now, global LNG developments will increasingly present opportunities to contribute to affordable, reliable, and lasting energy supplies for all EU customers. But receiving LNG in terminals and there's ample capacity, by the way, is just the first part of the chain. You need, as Roberto also said, you need sufficient connected infrastructure to bring it to all parts of Europe. In these regions, where the market is not yet fully developed, targeted approaches may be considered, in particular, to develop liquid hubs and missing infrastructure. Here again, we need a consistent, a coherent policy framework, not sending out ambivalent messages. However, life is more complicated. Europe, com European Commission has developed the Energy Union Strategy in its original form that was a very defensive concept aimed at creating political power in the gas demand vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Luckily, in the recent proposals, the worst elements are out of the proposals such as the collective buying of Russian gas. Because the answer to the dominance of Russian gas in Eastern Europe should not be to reduce the number of buyers, but to increase the number of suppliers. Europe should copy the success of the MBP and the TTF and the likes by creating connecting infrastructure, reliable hubs, and thus attract more suppliers. But here, politics come in again with a little problem, just an example. Creating more competition in Central and Eastern Europe is a threat for gas imports from Russia through Ukraine. And Ukraine has a revenue of $5 billion per year from gas transit. Now, the European Commission, and I think they're strongly backed by the US government, makes it no secret that that revenue stream has to stay 
because they fear a failed state on their eastern border. So on the one hand, you want to diversify, become less dependent on Russia, and on the other hand, you want the Russian imports, especially through that channel, to remain intact. It's difficult to derive a clear investment signal from that, and it's an illustration of the tough challenges for European energy policy. Mr. Chairman, I conclude. What do we need in European energy policy? I think I have five points. First of all, the, the European Commission, I repeat, should not be ambivalent about the future role of gas. Europe needs a lot of gas in the decades to come. Second, give carbon the right price. Ben van Burden already mentioned it this morning. Let's hope that the Paris talks will help us in that respect. Third, invest in infrastructure, in south, in east, <coughs> connections, bringing south from, from gas from the south to the north, from the west to the east, and create, fourthly, liquid hubs in those regions. And then my last point, trust in the market. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Gertrude. Very interesting. Um, Matt McBay, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mike. Perhaps I will try to put the European gas demand and source of supply issue in the broader context a little bit in the beginning. Spend about uh, half an hour on that. <laughs> and uh, first, I think we should all recognize, and the discussion has shown that, the world's natural gas, and oil of course, for that matter, map has changed for demand, for supply, pricing, competition, technologies. Especially in gas, after the financial crisis of 2008, it's no longer the same picture. The demand is declining, and to the level of 1995 um, even. And uh, this side of 2020, we don't expect any significant demand growth here in Europe. But if you look at the rest of the world, the picture is a little bit different. Although China is going through this new uh, normal in terms of growth rate, 7%, but gas demand is expected to go up significantly. Projections have been scaled down, though, from you know, about, I think we were expecting from today's 170 BCM to around uh, 420 BCM by 2020. And it's going to be uh, much smaller than that. But still, in China, it's energy mix, the share of natural gas is less than 5%. So world average is around 22, 23%. Therefore, there is going to be upside on the Chinese side. However, China is also oversupplied today. You know, we know its domestic resources in China, in Sichuan, in Xinjiang, in South China Sea, elsewhere. Plus, in terms of shale gas, it has more resources than the United States has. But not the same technology, water, and other difficulties and, uh, that restrain it. We have coal, bad melting gas, and all others. So China is going to go up in terms of demand growth, no doubt about this. What we have now is a hitch up, so it's going to pass through. Middle East, when you look at the Middle East, we always think about supply. But in terms of demand, especially gas demand, is going to double by 2035 from current levels of around 400 to 800 BCM. So look at Egypt absorbing whatever you can give. I don't know whether your new finding will help that. But uh, so in the Gulf, Kuwait, I was talking to a friend of mine saying that they are even uh, importing LNG from Sakhalin rather than Qatar next door. So there is a huge potential in Saudi Arabia, other Gulf countries. And so demand side in terms of that will be huge. Europe, Russia, U.S. relatively less, depending on how the gasification in U.S. will go, of course. We cannot foresee that so much. And uh, on the EU side, what we see is that the Commission is wonderful in terms of producing blueprints, you know, new papers, 2020, Green Growth, 2050. Most of them are somehow disconnected from the reality on the ground, I should say. And uh, also, the, there is no homogeneity. You know, in Netherlands, you have about 30% share of natural gas, whereas it's, you know, about 15%, even less in Portugal, France, and Poland. And some of them heavily dependent on Russia, some of them not, LNG. So therefore, it's quite difficult to have a common shared policy towards that. Energy union, thousands of papers, still I don't understand what purpose it's going to serve. 
recycling the in previous initiatives. So enough for, I think, Brussels bashing. And uh, in terms of diversification, Europe will continue to depend heavily on Russia. There is no doubt about this. It's the resource uh, superpower. Nobody can stop Russia in this regard. Resources are there, next door neighbor. Yes, there might be difficulties in terms of uh, political relations, geopolitics of gas and others, but we are also using natural gas and energy as a weapon against Russia that we were criticizing in the past. They were using against us, Ukraine and others. So we have to, know, we have to find a way of managing Russia relationship. Difficult to divorce it from geopolitics, but we are there. Right now, I think it's about almost 40% in our uh, imports. And no way in the first quarter of this year, uh, two quarters of this year, I think, exceeded Russia in terms of supply. So Norway also will continue to be very reliable and energy security-wise sound supplier to European Union markets. And then North Africa, so it's that share around 22%. If Algeria can get its acts or into order, and Libya, of course, to Spain, France, um, uh, uh, and Italy perhaps, there will be more uh, sustainable flows. What will happen in EastMed, we don't know, because of the uh, big uh, ticket capital projects uh, have been put on the hold. Whether Leviathan will take off, they can't take a FID because of the lack of funds and uh, geological and geopolitical problems. And what will happen in Cyprus, an energy project didn't work, and now a pipeline to Egypt, to Itku, may not work as well because of the new discovery. And so, but ISMAT is there as a potential supply source. At some point, when the price is right, when all these difficulties have been overcome, it might happen. Then we have Iraq, especially Kurdish region of Iraq, where uh, the production is expected to start from 2019, initially 4 BCM, but gradually going to 10 BCM. And the Kurds have a very strong uh, gas agenda now. They want to push this forward. The resources are there. Off-taker is Turkey, uh, which will be receiving it at a fraction of the cost that we pay to Iran, Russia, and Azerbaijan. Therefore, it is one of the important sources for Turkey. Iran. We discuss it. Of course, it is the world's, among the world's largest hydrocarbon resources, but how are you going to mobilize it, especially production? Most of the production is in the south, south parts, and bring it to the western markets, northwest through Turkey. You need huge infrastructure to be built for that. It's not going to happen soon. They might perhaps provide a little bit more than what they provide, 10 BCM right now, another perhaps 3, 4 BCM to Turkey if the price is right. And uh, it will go probably initially to Pakistan and India because TAPI, the pipe dream, is not going to work, it seems, under the current circumstances. Central Asia is the gas tank of the, that part of the world. Turkmenistan has the fourth largest reserves in the world, but it's stranded. And Russia cut back most of its intake to 4 or 5 BCM only now from 75 BCM in the past. So China has received over the past six years about 125 BCM of gas, and they are ready to receive more if things go well, of course. Kazakhstan would like to add to that. And so east of Baku, forget about the West. There is no US, there is no EU except some of our companies. It's China and Russia uh, firing the shots there, and China will be linking its uh, you know, a landmark, it's the Xinjiang region, all the way through Central Asia to Turkey and Southeast Europe through this a one belt, one road initiative, Silk Road. So it's going to be another game changer for the region in, in, in many ways. A few words perhaps, if I may, about the southern. Yeah, uh, you've just been to, uh, Mehmet, you, you've uh, come back from St. Petersburg where um, last week I think they had the gas forum. Do you think that, uh, how are sanctions against Russia affecting their relationship with the European market and, and uh, well, Russia has been affected more by sanctions than the decline in oil prices, mm. definitely. About losses uh, around, I think, 70, 80 billion dollars last year from the sanctions and 40 from the decline in oil prices. And gas prices is still, they are benefiting a lot from the gas hub pricing, mm. not the oil index pricing. This, this is another, I think, important thing. Pricing mechanism will be changing. In Russia, there is a significant problem domestically because Gazprom has to compete now with Rosneft as well as independents like Novatech. Mm. 
increasing their production, but they don't have the license to export yet. But it will come, probably, because Putin is sending now Gazprom to St. Petersburg. They will be relocating there mm -hmm. and paying their taxes there. Out of sight might be out of mind. So we shall see how it's going to work. But uh, Russia definitely is revising its business strategy, gas business strategy, vis-a-vis -vis Europe, Turkey, the second largest buyer of Russian gas in the world, as well as Asia Pacific, especially China. This project they signed with China, 38 BCM of gas. And, uh, you know, I was a diplomat in Beijing back in 1989. Whenever I asked CMPC when it's going to finalize, they always told me that, you know, 95%, we are there, we'll sign soon. Since then, it's been going on. Now, 99%, this 1% is still about pricing. <laughs> so, the right pricing also not to be captive provider of gas only to one market. So, but of course, Russia will be spending a lot of efforts on the uh, Asian side, uh, not only China, Korea, and Japan as well. It's also a healthy situation for the global markets. I will say a few words about the Turkish stream, perhaps, if, if I may. This has become quite um, um, headlines recently. Putin decided to kill South Stream, realizing that it's not going to fly in Ankara back in December 2014. Instead, he reincarnated it as Turkish stream, as a music of Turkish ears. It will make you a gas hub, and the price will be also better. And uh, since then, negotiations are going on. Russians are pushing a lot of pressure on Ankara to sign up this as quickly as possible, inter inter intergovernmental agreement and uh, all other. But Turks are moving a little bit prudently, given their past experience in terms of uh, take or pay contracts, and 63 BCM is not easy to absorb. Turks will be getting about 14 BCM that they normally get through Ukraine. This is direct from Russia, that's good. This is the first leg, it will work. But other three legs will be very difficult unless you have an agreement between the European Union, Greece, Turkey, and Russia. And EU is not looking at, very, uh, uh, looking at it skeptically and uh, I think one key issue from the Russian point of view is that Ukraine has become a serious risk that they cannot mitigate, especially after what happened in Crimea, Eastern Ukraine. Therefore, they want to phase out Ukraine altogether, Turkey, then Nord Stream 2, which will increase the capacity to around, I think, 110 BCM. This is huge volume. And, uh, but whether the Turkish leg will work or not, still yet to be seen. Yeah. And Poland, uh, Ukraine, you cannot write it off because it has about 35 BCM of storage capacity, pumping stations, it's a market in itself. Sure. Therefore, I think what we are going to see over the next few years in terms of juggling, geopolitics, markets, pricing, investment, will be quite interesting to watch. Sure. Sure. And this issue of uh, European um, diversification of supplies is a, is a key one, obviously. Um, and uh, Roberto, I was just wondering, what's your feeling about, is that desire by the EU to diversify its supply away from Russia, is that reflected, do you think, in the company boardrooms in Western Europe? Well, uh, Russia is, uh, is a long-term uh, gas supplier, so uh, is there and will be there also for, uh, for many years, simply also because uh, from the commercial point of view, they have a long-term uh, contract. I think uh, that uh, the debate uh, should not be uh, Russian gas, yes or no. Uh, the debate uh, should be how to integrate uh, mm -hmm. the, the supply coming uh, from Russia, and then sure. clearly are, uh, are important for, uh, for, for Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, if we look at the European map, uh, how this uh, gas is distributed uh, is, uh, is, is, is an issue because you, you, you can see that, uh, for instance, there are the Eastern uh, European countries uh, almost uh, fully dependent on, on Russian gas, other countries with zero uh, gas coming, coming from Russia. So there should be a, a balance uh, also mm -hmm. within uh, Europe uh, in terms of uh, uh, accepting uh, this uh, uh, volume of, uh, of gas. Sure. What's your view on uh, Nord Stream 2, this new pipeline that we just heard mentioned, which is, it's, uh, you know, it comes in direct from Russia under the Baltic Sea to Germany, so it's not uh, governed by any well. EU rules. But it's being opposed by some of the East European states, like Ukraine, for example, saying it's going to rob them of some vital transit fees. Uh, we, 
you, you know, yeah. uh, as, as a company, we prefer, yeah. it, uh, we prefer it to uh, focus on EMP sector than yeah. uh, being part of uh, new transportation systems. So, so yeah. <laughs> I prefer okay. not to go. Okay, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, do, is it, do you think that uh, Nord Stream 2 is, is got, is, has some answers for, for, Europe, for the European market? Well, it's an alternative route of supply for Russian gas to Europe. And mm. I think the fact that the Russians are still investing in new infrastructure that brings gas to Europe shows that they believe that there will be a market for gas in Europe. That's the first very important yeah. signal. Mm. And I, I think it, 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 it would be important also that the politicians in Brussels realize that and, and, and show that they also have an interest in, in having more gas for Europe. Well, then all the political things around it, whether it is a com competition for the transit through the Ukraine and so, and so on, I already mentioned some about it. Mm. Um, <coughs> it's higher politics. Uh, I'm afraid I cannot uh, yeah. participate in that. Yeah. You mentioned in your uh, speech uh, earlier, your remarks earlier, that um, you know that you'd be looking that the industry would be looking for guidance for, from the poli EU policymakers, um, perhaps at the, uh, after the Paris talks. And, um, but I was wondering what sort of, in the absence of any moves from the policymakers, what sort, what can companies in, in the industry in, in Europe uh, do to encourage greater gas themselves, greater gas use? Well, I think what, what we must do is to, uh, to continue our efforts in gas advocacy uh, and not only say that we have the cleaner and the flexible mm. and so on uh, fuel, but also have a different approach in the dialogue with society. We must make a dialogue of it, not just us saying we are good, mm. but asking the people, well, what is the problem with our product? What can we do about that? How can we help you? How can you help us? What is the proper place for gas in that fuel mix that we will have in the next decades? Mm -hmm. And if you show to the people that gas provides so many ways of um, helping the renewables to get their place in the mix mm -hmm. by the flexibility. Mm -hmm. And that's not only flexibility on, on, a, on a macro level with the power plants uh, that, that have to compensate for wind energy that's not there, but also in, at, at the decentral level where people have their solar panels and the, 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 the fluctuation in the solar energy mm -hmm. now has to be adapted by the electricity grid. We have very many houses that not only have a connection to the electricity grid, but also to the gas grid, with mm. a great, a huge capacity. The capacity mm. of the gas grid is much higher in energy terms than the capacity of the electricity grid. So if we have the right appliances, hybrid heat, heat pumps, that, that help to compensate for that imbalance on the decentral level, we save not only a lot of money that has mm. to be invested otherwise mm -hmm. in, in new electricity grids, but we, we also um, uh, save a lot of energy, and um, I think that um, this is something that, um, that is not realized uh, by mm. policymakers who think in either all electric or fossil, and, yes. and that's not the right way of thinking. Very briefly, uh, we've, you know, we've talked about how the market's come down. Have, has, have we, in your opinion, reached a bottom yet? Is, is there any way up from here? I'm afraid no. <laughs> Um, I'm afraid that the, these efforts to get gas out of the heating uh, area um, are, are very strong, not only in Brussels, but also in some of the capitals. Um, on the other hand, um, this is a, a very inelastic uh, uh, segment. Uh, it mm -hmm. will take a long time before you change the whole built environment from gas to electricity. I don't think it will work that fast and it will be extremely expensive yeah. and we will, be able to, we will be able to show to society that a more cost-effective approach can be realized by using gas. Sure, <coughs> great, thank you. Uh, Mehmet Bey, I'd just uh, would like to release some time for questions, but uh, I'd like to ask you, um, uh, we've got another big event coming up um, in less than a month. It's the 1st of November, it's uh, a new uh, election in Turkey after they had some inconclusive um, elections in back in June and they're, they're holding them again and um, <coughs> Turkey has emerged as a pivotal nation for European gas supply uh, whether it's coming from the Caspian from Azerbaijan potentially one day Turkmenistan 
as you mentioned, uh, Ira northern Iraq, Kurdistan, uh, Iran one day to Eastern Med. And of course, Russian gas comes through Turkey too. So it's, it's a pivotal uh, nation with a pivotal relationship between EU and how they balance that with the Russians. 1st of November, what's your view on how that could shape up and will it have a bearing on the European gas market, do you think? Well, let me first uh, establish a link between 1st November Turkish election and the competitiveness in gas. <laughs> the letter is, uh, I just want to add to you that I think when we look at gas, we have to bear in mind competitiveness as well, because in US and Europe and Japan, when you look at the prices, three different sets of prices, which affect significantly our companies' uh, competitiveness. That's the reason we are a little bit annoyed by how European Commission is handling these issues without any regard to the competitiveness of our industries and also the uh, prices. And so that's an important issue to uh, bear in mind because some of the European industries are being relocated now to US because of the regasification mm -hmm. of the economy there and the cheaper gas prices. Coming to Turkey, I think energy is always high on top of Turkish <coughs> political agenda because we depend 98% in natural gas, 93% in petroleum oil uh, on imports. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the reason why we consider it as a national security matter. It's not a simple commodity for Turkey. It is handled that way. The liberalization is somehow uh, held back. It's not moving as fast as we hope. Mm -hmm. And the government composition will change after the first November election. Yeah. Most likely that we will not have a single party government led by AKP and our uh, executive imperial president. <laughs> and uh, we will probably have a coalition government coming to the picture because since June, nothing has changed, more or less the same configuration, unless something that we, we don't foresee. But the geopolitical tension around us, especially in Syria, what's happening in Syria, more than two million refugees in Turkey, Russian airplanes entering Turkish airspace, Iranian soldiers getting into Syria, and uh, tension in Black Sea with Russia. And these are well, Ismat tensions with Israel and rest. So these are not giving a good picture in terms of geopolitical stability in the region. Therefore, Turkey needs to have a stable government mm. to push through its energy policy internally as well as in terms of its external energy outreach, including with EU. We know that EU accession process will not happen. And, but EU is looking to Turkey in terms of as a gateway for its energy security. But Turkey, of course, thinks that it comes, its interest comes first before serving the European Union interest. But over the medium to long term, I'm very optimistic about Turkey's role in the region yeah. as a major hub in natural gas and oil as well, going through Bosphorus and through Jehan. And so Turkey has to be supported for this role because it's one of the corridors. Yeah. Because Southern Gas Corridor we talk about, it's not a corridor in my view, mm -hmm. 16 BCM of gas coming from Shah Deniz II, six for Turkey, 10 for Southeast Europe. It's the front runner of a corridor which will come at a later stage, probably in the next yeah. decade or so. Yeah. yeah, great, thank you. Great, well, I think we'll just move to questions and just briefly sum up what I think we've uh, been looked at. We've, uh, Europe does need some answers. The European gas industry will be looking uh, the policy makers um, at the uh, Paris climate talks um, to, to perhaps rejuvenate the industry. Maybe we haven't reached the bottom just yet. Um, you know, the gas uh, security, gas di uh, diversif diversification of the gas supply is very important still. And uh, Russia's also got, still got a very important role to play in supplying Europe. Um, if we uh, have any questions from the audience? I can see one over there. Thank you. Yeah, hello. Um, Nigel Topping from We Mean Business. Um, I wanted to go back to Gertrude's point, and it seems to be uh, a lot of talk today that we just need to get the price right to drive the shift from coal to gas. And also, seems to be quite a lot of faith being placed in what might or might not happen in Paris. So I wanted to clarify what's not going to happen in Paris and then ask a question about what the right price is. So we already know that Paris will not set any mechanism for putting a global price on carbon. At best, there'll be some weak language about market linkage. It'll be sovereign states. It'll be Europe and uh, California and Chile and China implementing regional and national schemes that will put prices on carbon. China is not minor. 
It's, I, it's I, huge. I, I, I it's didn't, a big country. I didn't say minor, but it won't be a global scheme in Paris. I think it's really important that people are not misled to think that Paris is a negotiation about putting a global price on carbon. Um, in fact, it will just be a solidification of national commitments, which won't be enough to meet the global target of getting within two degrees. My, my, my question to the panel is, what is the right price? I think, Kirchhoff, you've talked rightly about losing the narrative battle with the media and with civil society. I think part of the problem is that you keep saying we need the right price, but you never say what it is, which is not a good tactic for building trust. HSBC just said that it needs to be over $30 to drive the switch in Europe. BHP Billets are now publishing their two-degree scenario, saying it'll need to be $50 for a smooth transition, $80 for a delayed policy move, and then a hike. So it'd be really interesting to hear what the panel think the price needs to be to drive the switch from coal to gas in Europe uh, and in other jurisdictions around the world. And I think that's going to be an important thing for you to get used to talking about to build the credibility um, that you talk about needing to win. Well, um, I think that in, in my capacity as president of Eurogas, we have uh, uh, talked about uh, a CO2 price of 50, 60 euros per ton. And I think that is what you need to compensate for the price differential that we see today between coal and, uh, and gas to make gas attractive to burn it in, uh, in power stations. Okay. Yeah. If, I may, if I may add to that, if what we discuss uh, will be happening in terms of abundant supply of natural gas and that pushing the prices down globally because it's going to be a buyer's market inevitably you will have a cheaper price for natural gas. It will also perhaps kick, uh, as a result of also climate change discussions, uh, call a little bit to the sidelines. So therefore, the cheaper natural gas, at least over the next decade, uh, is probably what we should be expecting in light of huge oversupply of natural gas in the market. Roberto, have you got any views? Do you know? Uh, Car do you think carbon capture and storage is, a, is an important part of the equation as well for helping to well, uh, promote gas? Well, uh, certainly CCS is, uh, is part of, uh, of the equation. I think uh, that uh, should be appreciated that uh, uh, all uh, uh, or many of the oil and gas companies uh, are uh, taking uh, the, the, the climate change issues very, very seriously. Uh, as uh, uh, Mr. Van Berden reminded this morning, as, as uh, European companies, we, we sent uh, a letter uh, jointly with uh, other European players uh, to ask for a carbon pricing uh, system that uh, must be discussed. Uh, I mean, without uh, uh, preconcept, but uh, we think that uh, it's time to discuss uh, carbon pricing uh, to uh, create more competitiveness uh, among uh, the, uh, the, 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 the source uh, of, uh, of energy. Uh, nowadays, uh, more than 80% of the energy in the world uh, is uh, generated by fossil fuels. So mm -hmm. clearly we cannot uh, move uh, uh, to a, a renewable area from, uh, from, uh, from during overnight. Uh, but uh, certainly gas, uh, as uh, we discussed uh, today, uh, can play a, a better role uh, simply because uh, CO2 emissions are 50% uh, of, uh, of uh, the one generated by the coal. So um, that's why we, we think that uh, gas advocacy is uh, really very important and is a main topic nowadays. Mm. Thank you. We're running out of time, but we've got time for one more question if there's if there's one out there, please. This one here, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Otto Waterlander, um, partner in McKinsey. Um, Mr. Mehmet, at the end of his uh, summary, really explained how difficult it must be for the politicians when you explained the political troubles in the region. And as a politician, are you really going to get a lot of credits or kudos if you trade in Ukraine, Russia problems, for Iran, Iraq, Kurdistan, Turkey problems, uh, in particular in the current environment, and I think the answer is probably not. And I don't think that that is going to change in the short term. So my question to you really is that, looking at the frustration I think that many people share in the, um, in the industry, 
about policymakers not being able to do what is app apparently right for the industry, then two alternatives come to the play. And the first question I have for you is, how serious do you think the opportunity is to really get to a carbon tax relatively soon, now that the oil prices or the energy prices have really reduced uh, so much? Um, and the second point is, um, is the industry not making the, the case way too difficult? Should we not simply advocate, let's get rid of coal, and perhaps even support Greenpeace in the uh, launch that they did today and do a crowdfunding exercise around that? Can we just have a quick comment from each one of you, please, on that? Just, uh, and we'll have to wrap up. I'm afraid the world is not that simple, Otto, but um, uh, <laughs> it would be helpful, yeah. Helpful to get rid of coal. Red of, coal red down, of course, yeah. 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 Politicians yeah. usually have you know, short time span because they have to survive in politics mm -hmm. and run for the next election. Therefore, they don't have the long-term lead time or vision as we have in the industry because once you put your money, FID, it takes minimum three, four years to get a result. It has to be 40, 50 years. Therefore, relying on politicians for policy making and mandarins in Brussels are not very healthy. So therefore, it's very important that the industry engagement with them should be very strong. Thank you. Roberto. Well, just the hope that apart from objectives uh, in Paris or in any other venue, uh, we will see also uh, as industry uh, plans, uh, concrete plans uh, to achieve uh, these uh, this objectives because otherwise it's too simple to, to fix uh, limits, thresholds, uh, and then leaving to the industry the way how to, to reach it. So I think that uh, this is a uh, uh, main, uh, main comment. Great. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your contributions. Please join me in... Thank you in the panel today.